That sounds so much more ominous than I really am. <laughs> How is everyone? I want to ask you to do me a favor. If you have not yet signed up for a Serving Sunday project, because you're thinking, oh, I'll just take next week off. <laughs> Don't do that. We are worshiping together next Sunday. We are just doing it in a different way than we typically do it. We are probably participating in the most authentic expression of worship that there is. And that is taking the love of God and sharing it with some other people by helping them. Um, I think I explained to you a week or so ago, when we set out for Serving Sunday, um, we made a commitment to a host of organizations. We will bring volunteers to your place to help you with what you need. And we made a commitment for like over 400 people. We need about 40 more to be able to reach the goal of not just hitting a number, but making sure that every one of these organizations that we've made a commitment to, that we can honor that commitment. So if you haven't yet, I really encourage you. It's a great opportunity to do something really important. It's also a great opportunity to meet some other people that you might not know yet from your church family because you'll be serving alongside of them. It's a great way to build some friendships. And what you do next Sunday will not only be an act of worship, it'll make a difference. And so I really want to encourage you, if you haven't yet, do that today so that we can, we can plan for you. I'm going to be out at the Hill Country Women's Shelter. We're going to be painting. And um, if you want to paint with me, come on out and join me there because we could always use a little bit more help. Make sense? I've shared with you before that one of the frustrations with kind of our approach to teaching here at Cibolo Creek where we select a topic and sort of explore it over a couple of weeks. Um, I've shared with you before that one of the frustrations is that we never have the same people in the room two weeks in a row. And so then I always feel some, what of a, some sort of a compulsion to want to review what we talked about last Sunday. It's just a way of getting everybody caught up. And then I run out of time for what I want to share with you this Sunday, but I think this is important. So we're going to, we're going to go ahead and just, just by way of review, or for those of you who weren't with us last week, we've probably all found ourselves here at some time or another. In fact, some of you are saying I'm here right now, physically exhausted, emotionally drained, whether it's because of work, you got lots of littles running around your house that you're trying to raise and provide for. You got some drama going on in your marriage or your extended family. You got some health concerns, but you're, you're feeling this. We've all been there. We all will be there. It's important at times to drill down inside of that because it's really more than just physical or emotional. And if we're honest, here's how we're really feeling. We're, we're really, we're worried, we're stressed, we're, we're really bitter about something that's happened in our past and we just can't let go. Maybe we're feeling sad, very frustrated with something, uh, we're feeling resentful. Uh, a whole host of really legitimate feelings that we're all sensing. And most of the time, the way that we think that we're going to solve this or make this better is by going on some sort of a vacation or taking a break. Now, I'm, all, I'm pro vacation, okay? So it's, it, it, it can be a good experience. But, but the question we have to ask is, what if all along it's not really our body that's tired, it's not really our mind that's worn out? What if... What if what we're really sensing is that our soul is weary? Because when you take a look at that list of all those kind of um, evidences of being physically exhausted and emotionally worn out, physically exhausted and emotionally worn out can be cured by a great vacation, but soul tired cannot. You have to deal with your soul differently. And this discussion that we're having is how do we take care of our soul? So here's, here's one of the most important things. I really want to make sure you guys get this. This is so critical. We look at a list like this and what we need to understand is that at every, behind every one of these things, I don't care what, which one best describes you right now, every one of these, they're spiritual at their root. 
There's something going on inside of your soul that's creating these sorts of symptoms in your body, in your mind, in your life. So every one of these things is deeply spiritual at its core, and really the solution to it, or the, 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 yeah, the solution towards some sort of a more healthy existence, is we have to address what's going on in my soul. Does that make sense? And so here, here's just the truth about that list, is probably one of three things is happening. I'm either trusting something or somebody other than God, and therefore I'm worried or I'm afraid because I don't think that God's going to come through for me or I'm more concerned about my job and making a living and providing for my needs. And I'm not really trusting God as much as I'm trusting in that job. Or I'm living my life outside of God's design or purpose. I've shared with you before, I'm a big design guy. God has designed life to work a certain way. He's designed work to work a certain way, he's designed relationships to work a certain way, he's designed marriage to work a certain way, he's designed money to work a certain way. And when we step outside of God's design for those things, it shouldn't surprise us then that something doesn't feel right inside of us, something doesn't go as well as we'd like it to because we're outside of the design that God's promised to bless. Or I'm just reaping the consequences of choices that I've made outside of God's will. And the backwash of poor choices has created all of these dilemmas inside of my life. Does that make sense? So how do we address the needs of our soul? And what I introduced to you last Sunday is that there's this ageless design of God that's been established since the creation of the universe as a way that we take care of our soul and it's typically referred to as Sabbath and Sabbath means to rest or to stop to stop one thing so that I can take care of some more important things and here's what we um, we explored last week just briefly as a way to set up this discussion today. Most everything about contemporary society, the world in which we live, the culture that we're surrounded by, most everything about contemporary society competes against what it takes to nurture a healthy soul. And so it's very common for many people, Christians, to be navigating their way through life while their soul is just worn out. And the soul isn't doing the work that God intended it to do because of the challenges that it's having to endure. And so we talked about the greatest threats to Sabbath rest for your soul is a world of hurry, a life of noise, and a life of clutter. So we're going to be unpacking those. And today I want to talk to you a little bit about hurry. Now let's let's just clarify one thing. People most people hear the word Sabbath, they think, oh, that's Old Testament kind of stuff. Or, you know, it's at best it's like going to church. I just want you to know this. Sabbath is not a day off and it's not an hour at church. The spirit, the design of Sabbath is more than just going to church on a Sunday. It's just more than just stopping what I'm doing for a little while and taking a break. Sabbath is an occasion set aside to invest in the needs of your soul. So it's not just stopping and doing nothing. It's stopping the other things that distract our lives so that I can take some time to meet the needs of my soul, nurture the needs of my soul. It's not just going to church and checking a box. It's going to church as a way or as an experience that might provide something that's good for my soul. So the cure for a tired and weary soul is not a place, it's not the beach, it's not the mountains, as lovely as those places are, for a soul that's tired, it's not a place, it's not a pleasure, really what we're talking about, it's a relationship with the person, and that person's name is Jesus. So we can talk about like Old Testament Sabbath, which was, you know, commanded by law. We're taking the design of Sabbath. We're no longer under the obligations of that command. But now we're looking at the spirit. What was the spirit behind God's design for Sabbath? And I would say it this way. The spirit of Sabbath is time spent nurturing your relationship with Jesus 
for the good of your soul. Does that make sense? So Jesus says this, come, come to me. Remember, it's not a place. It's a person. Jesus, come to me. All of you who are weary and burdened with life, come to me and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. That's a first century description of like a disciple. It's basically about learning. Learn from me. Learn my way of life. Learn what it is to live by my faith. Learn, take this yoke upon you. Learn from me for I am gentle and I'm humble of heart. I'm not going to beat you up. I'm going to take care of you if you'll give me the opportunity to do so. And you will find rest for what? Your soul. Your soul that picks up on all the negative energy of the life that you're currently living. It needs some rest. I will provide that for you. For my way of life is easy and my burden is light. Or Jesus gives two very practical ways that he can provide rest to your soul. He says this, come to me. You, you got to come to me. You got you to come to me in relationship and then you have to learn from me. I have some things to teach you about the wisest and best way to do life. Are you ready? Both of these take time. In order to nurture a relationship with Jesus, you have to spend time with him. To learn from Jesus, you have to spend time with him. And you can't do either of them in a hurry. You can't do either of these things of coming to spend time with Jesus. You can't do this idea of learning a way of life from him if you're always in a hurry. These things take time. So if we want to know the rest that Jesus promises for our soul, we have to give it the time that it deserves. Make sense? So let's talk a little bit about what it means to live hurried lives when it comes to our soul. Now, uh, we're going to take a little bit of a, um, the long way home. I've been a pastor now for 35 years. I've talked to lots and lots and lots of people about things spiritual and faith and God and belief. All, thousands of conversations with Christians and with non-Christians. This sort of comes with the territory of my job, right? It's been interesting to me how both Christians and non-Christians tend to think how the Bible works. And so when somebody like me says, this is something we should be doing, or when I say something like, this is something we shouldn't be doing, I meet people and they say, show me in the Bible. And here's what they demand. They go, I want to see a chapter and a verse. Show me a chapter and a verse where it says, I should live like this or I shouldn't live like this. And you know what? Sometimes I can do that. Because sometimes there are particular chapters and verses that specifically describe the way that God intends us to live our lives. Make sense? But sometimes it's not that easy. Sometimes you have to take like dozens of verses and kind of put them together and create a composite of an understanding of God's will on a matter. It's just not always one succinct little statement. And some people, they get a little leery of it if you have to sort of think too hard about it. But sometimes you have to take a couple of verses and, and look at them and say, this gives us an idea of what it is that God wants us to do when it comes to living our lives. And sometimes, sometimes it's just looking at observations that you see throughout the Bible in the lives of characters that we meet in the Bible, the instructions of Jesus, sometimes the things that are being addressed by the, early, the letters to the early church. And sometimes you just have to sit back and you have to kind of learn from observation of what you're seeing in the scriptures. Does that make sense? So a few years ago, a number of years ago now, I read something in a book. I, I, unfortunately, I don't remember what the name of the book was. But I just, I remember reading this sentence and I was like, well, is 
that true? And the more I thought about it, I was like, I, I, I think that's true. Here, here was the gist of the sentence in the book. We never see Jesus in a hurry. And I was like, what? what? I, I think that's, that's true. In fact, in fact, if you look at the life of Jesus, particularly as it unfolds in the, li- in the story of the Gospels, you step back and you look at the life of Jesus from his birth to his resurrection and his ascension, you go, not only do I not see him in a hurry, sometimes it seems like it's the opposite. It's like he's not in, not in any kind of a hurry at all. And so there, there were these times, like there's this one occasion in the Gospels where Jesus gets up very early in the morning and he, he leaves the house where he's, he's staying and he, he goes off into the, into the, like the garden to pray. And the disciples chase him down like hours later. And they're like, where are you? Where, where, where have you been? Do you, do you not, we got a busy day. There's all these people back at the house and they're waiting. They want to talk to you. They want to hear you teach. They need some miracles. They, they have needs. And, and Jesus says, yeah, I'm not going back to the house. Just go ahead and send them away because we're leaving. And then and we think of like Jesus, one of his best friends, his name was Lazarus. And Lazarus was very sick. And they had sent word to Jesus that Lazarus was really, really sick and he was going to die. Jesus doesn't show up for another four days. <laughs> and when he does, Mary and Martha, Lazarus' uh, sisters, they, like, they give Jesus all kinds of heartache. They're like, where have you been? If you had been here, if you had hurried, we this wouldn't have happened. Our brother wouldn't have died. You, you could have helped him. Well, we talk about the miracle of Jesus walking on the water. Do you ever think of that from the disciples' perspective? Wouldn't you like have hoped that he would have been running on the water? Because <laughs> they're like in distress. They're desperate. They think they're going to die. And here's Jesus. He's just... <laughs> He's never in a hurry. Well, we step back and we look at that. And there might be something that we can learn from that. About how we go about living our lives like Jesus invites us to. Now, Jesus wasn't lazy. He wasn't irresponsible. He was just, he was purposeful. And he lived his life with a certain, with a certain calm about him. That was fueled by his enormous faith. He was never in a hurry. Jesus was never driven by or enslaved to the expectation of others for him. Do you understand that? No, no, no. Do, do you understand that? He was not driven by others' expectations, nor was he enslaved to them. Who are we supposed to be like? We're supposed to be like Jesus. If our calling is to be like Jesus, then somehow we have to learn that we shouldn't be driven by others' expectations for us or enslaved to them. And yet most of us, we live our lives just like that. So when it comes to studying the Bible and 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 learning the way of Christ and, and what the Bible has to teach, we, we have to kind of take in a number of different influences. There, there's, first of all, there's just God's truth. God has established one truth for all of mankind, and, and, and it's, the, it's the only truth that actually exists. Now, I can tell you, and you know that right now, God's truth isn't very popular. There's a lot of talk about, well, this is my truth and that's your truth and nobody, there's no one. No, at the end of the day, there's just God's truth and eventually every one of us will answer to it. Then we just have what we know about what God's like, his character, his love, his mercy, his grace, his justice, his righteousness, his holiness. That teaches us something about how we are to live our lives. Then you have it captured in God's truth and his character is just like the wisdom of God. Like what's the wisest way to go about living our life? And then we have God's instructions, those specific chapters and verses that tell us very clearly what God's design for us is. And you put all of these together and you can, 
you can come up with biblical principles about how we go about living our life. Does, does that make sense? Does that make sense? Okay, so I want to show you a biblical principle that captures this. It's found in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul wrote a letter to the church at Corinth in the first century. And the Apostle Paul is writing this church and he's giving them instructions about how they live their lives as Christians. As Christians. Okay, you ready? You ready? Okay, so here's, here's what the Apostle Paul writes. I have the right to do anything. Now you'll notice that's in quotes. The Apostle Paul, the best we can understand in interpreting this passage, this was a very popular saying at the time. Particularly among Christians. The Apostle Paul was hearing from the church, well, I have the right to do anything because I'm saved and I've been forgiven and I'll always be forgiven and God's grace, even when I mess up and do wrong, I have God's grace and he'll always love me and I still get to go to heaven when I die, it doesn't matter what I do. And, and so Paul's hearing this in the church, I have the right to do anything, you say. But the Apostle Paul, he provides some perspective to it and he says, but... But not everything that you might have the right to do is beneficial. Not necessarily good for you. It doesn't have good return. I have the right to do anything. But Paul says, I'm not going to be mastered by anything. Because sometimes some of the stuff that we get ourselves involved in, it can actually become addictive or compulsive. And, and we can't get away from it because now it controls us. This is, this is a passage of scripture to the first century church. Here's a, here's a way that you might interpret it. Just because you could doesn't mean you should. Just because you could do something doesn't mean you should. And the Apostle Paul gives us two reasons why. One is it might not be beneficial to your life. You can do it. It just isn't good for you. Or you can do it, but it might lead to the loss of control over your life. Suddenly, you're not living your life. Somebody else or something else is living it for you. So let me say it this way. You can live your life in a hurry. You can chase after all the things. You, you can go 100 miles an hour. You, you can live your life fast and furious. You can live your life any way you want. Say yes to all the good, the important. I mean, you, you can say yes to the good things. <laughs> Why not? You can, you can say, well, I think this is really important. I, I should do this. Uh, this is really interesting. This is, this is my problem. Everything interests me. All right. I, I had to decide a few years ago, Paul, you, you can't do everything. You can only do a few things. So choose the best things. But I, I have an endless fascination. I'm an incredibly curious person. Uh, and fun things. Why not do the fun things? Why, why not do the profitable things? You can live your life with as much of that as is possible. And here's what I'll tell you. You're not doing anything wrong. You're not doing anything immoral. You're not sinning per se. You're not violating some, you know, 11th commandment no one's ever told you about. So it's not wrong to live life in a hurry. I mean, you, you, you can seize opportunities. And you can pursue your interest and you can accept obligations for certain responsibilities. You, you can honor commitments. You can shoulder responsibilities. You can meet expectations. You can adopt priorities. Go for it. Go as much as you want. But just because you could doesn't mean you should. Because what the scriptures have to teach us both implicitly and explicitly is that a life full of hurry is not good for the soul in fact a life lived in too much of a hurry 
for too long will ultimately injure your soul. Did you hear me? A life lived too fast and furious for too long actually ends up injuring your soul. Now, I, I could have gone a dozen different directions today. I go, God, I, I, I can't go a dozen different directions. What's the one direction I, I, that would be most helpful? So I'm just following my heart here today. Ready? Here's what God said. Please help them understand this. He, he didn't say that like that like sentence. That was my impression of what God was laying. Like. Right. Ooh, that sounds right. No, it's not like that. You ready? Hurry leads to skimming. You know, like when you go to the, like a river or a lake, pick up a flat rock, you skim it. That's how a lot of us live our lives. We're just skimming from one thing to the next. Just spending a little bit of time here and then, then we're on to the next thing and eventually what happens? Bottom of the river. That's how a lot of people live their lives. They're just skimming from one thing to the next. Never really spending any quality time experiencing the moments of their life. Hurry leads to skimming. You ready? Still with me? Skimming leads to superficiality. You know what superficiality is? It's when we put on the fake smile. Hey, how you doing? Oh, doing good, doing good. Meanwhile, inside your soul's dying. Doing well, yeah. Fake sympathy, oh, it must be so bad. You're like, I'm so burnt out. I don't care what's happening in your life because I got all this going on over here. <laughs> Fake concern. No, I'm really concerned about that. I don't have any time to do any of that. Fake joy. Yeah, I'm happy. <laughs> and it's all fake because deep down inside, you know, I'm not happy right now. My heart's breaking. Fake enthusiasm, fake passion. Because you neither have the time nor the energy to be truly authentic in the moments with the people that you're with at that time. Because hurry leads to skimming. And skimming leads to superficiality. You want to know the hard truth about superficiality? It's just basically pretend. Pretend. Superficiality, you just pretend to be happy. You just pretend to be living your life. You just pretend to be fulfilled. But down in the most private recesses of your soul, you know the truth about yourself. And what it is is that you're empty and you're bitter and you're resentful. Why? Because we just live so fast. That our soul's gotten so tired, our soul can't do what the soul was designed to do. You can neither absorb God's love for you, nor can you share God's love with others when you're in a hurry. If all we're doing, if all we're doing, because you know, this is for me too. If all we're doing is skimming through life and we're not taking any time to nurture the soul, then we're not taking any time to receive God's love to us. And we don't have the time to authentically share God's love with others. John Orberg wrote this. Love and hurry are fundamentally incompatible. Love takes time. And time is the one thing hurried people do not have. When you and I live our lives for far too long without any margins to rest, it just leads to burnout. And we just become like these empty shell of the people that God intended us to be. And we're not really living our life like God intended. And the really sad truth 
for really busy people. Christians is that in the great hurry to keep up with all the things, work and kids and interests and hobbies and obligations and commitments in the, in the, the pursuit of trying to, to, to take care of all of them well, my observation, both from my own life, my observation as a pastor, is that a lot of times God's the one who's the first to be jettisoned. I just don't have time for God today. I just don't have time to nurture my soul today. I, I just don't have time to really cultivate a relationship with God because I've got so many things to do. And when we rush through our relationship with God, when we rush through our Sabbath, then it just leads to spiritual superficiality. We're just going through the motions. Skimming through what it takes to nurture your soul will result in a superficial relationship with God. Does this make sense? This might help. If, if we think of our soul as a compass, which it is, if we think of our soul as a compass, it requires time with God to keep the compass properly oriented to true north. If we continually neglect our time spent getting to know Jesus and cultivating our relationship with God, it shouldn't surprise us then that our compass gets off and we end up in places doing things, pursuing stuff that God never intended for us. Such a great verse in the book of Psalms, Psalm 46. Be still. Be still and know that I am God. Part of Sabbath rest is being reminded, oh, that's right. God, me, in relationship to him, that changes what's important. That changes what I'm afraid of. That changes what I'm worried about. But if I never take the time to be still, then my soul tends to wander away from that truth. The word still, be still, means to cease striving. Quit all the going all the time. Take some time to stop. Be still. Simple lesson is this. It's hard to know Jesus when you're always in a hurry. Don't think for a second that you'll be the exception. Oh, Paul, this is the way I'm wired. I, I can do a lot of things. I can just sort of by osmosis do the God thing. No, you can't. I'm just telling you, you can't. You think you can, but your soul is slowly dying inside of you. Because it needs time to come to Jesus and to learn from him. Make sense? Let me leave you with this thought. You know as a pastor. From time to time I'm called to, on to do funerals. There's different approaches to how you comfort people. In the midst of a loss. And you try to speak hope. And you try to speak love and comfort into their life it just takes different different angles from time to time here's, here's one of the angles that I've, I've used to try to remind people particularly if the person they've lost has been younger uh, we, we have categories when somebody's really really old we know that eventually we all die we miss them, we grieve their loss, but we go, oh, they lived a long, good life. But when we lose somebody long before we think, it, it just tends to make us a bit more 
teachable. And so here's, here's one of the ways that I've invited people to think. Like taking photos with a camera. When we live our life in too much of a hurry, all of our memories come out blurry. So here's what I'm going to do. Imagine your life as a collection of photographs. Imagine if everything that you did, everything that you did every day was actually a picture. Here's a picture of you eating your breakfast. Here's a picture of you headed out the door to work. Here's a picture of you celebrating your birthday. Here's a picture of you uh, going to see a movie. It's everything that you do was a photograph. All told, we, our life would be literally millions of photographs. And we took all those photographs and we put them into a binder, like a, a photo album. What kind of pictures do you have? What kind of photographs are, are in the album? Millions of pictures of your life, but you were going so fast that all of the pictures came out blurry. Does that make sense? We, we grab the moments of our life as we breeze on through to the next thing and, and the camera of our mind just can't keep up. If we're not careful, all of the pictures that we have of our life or the lives of those people that we love, they're, they're, they're all out of focus. We're in too big of a hurry. We, we were distracted. I mean, we're at the family gathering, but we're really a whole other place in our mind. We're, we're here, but we're somewhere else. <laughs> we're, we're at the, the birthday celebration, but we're on our phone. We're relating to people who aren't even in the room. Because for some reason, they're more important than, than this moment with these people right here, right now. And we do it. Over and over and over again, we're, we're at some place, but we, we, I, I have to go. I have to be somewhere else. And so we're not really here because we have to get there. And, and we do that too much. And pretty soon, all of the photographs of our life, they're blurry. And I think what Jesus wants to say to you is, come here. I don't want you to live like that. I had a whole different way for you to live. I wanted something more for you. I wanted you to learn about slowing down. So that you don't skim through the one and only life that you have. So, can you do your life in a hurry? Sure, have at it. Go for it. Just know, it's not good for your soul. And I can't take you to a chapter and a verse. I can take you to hundreds of them. That you put together and God's wisdom is saying to you, slow it down. Say no now and then. Choose a couple of the best things to give your life to the other stuff will take care of itself but whatever you do don't miss the one and only life I had for you and whatever you do don't try to do it without me make sense I may ask you to stand together I ask you to just bow your head. Privacy of your own conversation with God. Just, just ask him honestly right now. God, am I too busy? Am I too busy? Am I too busy? 
Maybe ask it this way, God, am I so busy I don't have any time for you other than what I can squeeze in quickly on a Sunday morning if the preacher doesn't go over time? God, am I so busy that the few minutes I give to you are just rushed? Father in heaven, you and your infinite wisdom and your perfect design and your outrageous love, you've invited us to enjoy life, to know peace and hope and love and joy. And in a hundred different ways, you've told us you can't do any of them in a hurry. It's just not good for your soul. So I ask, Father, that through the work of your spirit, you would do something in our hearts and our minds this week. Cause us to be really honest with ourselves before you and ask, can I do this differently? Can I take some better pictures of the one and only life that I'll have on this earth? Slow us down, Father, I pray, for the good of our soul. I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen.